Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Pavla Petrova, for who they don't know me yet. I am a director of the Arts and Theatre Institute in Prague. And I would like to welcome you, all of you, um, at the open session Culture of Mobility in the Time of Climate Change, which is part of the cycle of ITR conferences uh, focus point. The public session is organized by the ITI in association with the International Network of Mobility Information on the Move and the space we are right now, CAMP, Center for Architecture and Metropolitan Planning. And I would like to thank our partner as well. The conference, conference is also a highlight of a close meeting, General Assembly of the On the Move Network which finished yesterday. And On The Move has been engaged in different aspects of mobility, including sustainability, for a long time. The Secretary General of On The Move, Marie Le Sur, will tell you certainly a lot about later this morning. Also, the ITI is engaged in mobility for a long time. We are interested in mobility in all its shapes, such as traditional international cooperation, the program of exchange residencies in different fields of arts since 2004, travel grants, go and see mobility, for Czech cultural workers since 2013, or since 2018, information support of mobility through the newly established Czech Mobility Info Point, which is part of the international network of information points in Europe. The natural and logical feature is that we are interested also in issues regarding cultural sustainability. Having been inspired by the European Cultural Foundation in Amsterdam, member of uh, On The Move Network, uh, we have introduced this year a new criterion for assessing applications in our Go and See program in accord with the principles of sustainability and mo sustainability of living. This year's edition of the Prague Quadrennial, the world's largest exhibition of stage design and theater architecture in Prague, which will happen in June, will be special due to responsible treatment of natural sources and sustainability living. And finally, as an institution, we also joined other Czech cultural institutions and organizations in signing the appeal to support the announcement of the state of climate emergency in Prague, which is uh, the first step from the field of culture to push policy makers to start actively think about changes because we are in front of changes, complex changes in our mind and in the whole system itself. And uh, I am uh, looking forward to our inspiring uh, speakers. But before, uh, I uh, would like to introduce a uh, moderator of public session, uh, Barbara Doležalova which is uh, part of uh, our Czech Mobility Info Point, and I give you the floor. Good morning. Uh, I would like to briefly uh, say what we are going to do this morning. Uh, the session, uh, we will start with two keynotes. Uh, after, we will have a short coffee break, and uh, then we will meet here again for a panel discussion with our eight brilliant panelists. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, Václav Novotny, I would like to welcome Stepan, who is the director of CAMP, of this uh, beautiful space we are here, and um, to introduce you, CAMP. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm super happy that you're all here. Uh, we're at CAMP, which is the Center for Architecture and metropolitan planning. Uh, you've caught us in a little bit of a weird time between two exhibitions. As you can see, uh, there are men preparing some public space obstacles because uh, the next exhibition that we have is called City Block and it is about urban design and barriers in, in public space. 
uh, camp uh, is has been open for two years and it serves as a platform as a sort of an urban hub for anyone for architects for the public for investors developers and basically anyone who's interested in the future development of, of Prague so uh, we are here from Tuesday to Sunday from 9 to 9 if anyone wants to come in and ask what is going to be built in my neighborhood why is this street closed what is the plan for this uh, development uh, this is camp and this is why we are here. So I'm uh, happy that you're here and please enjoy our, our space. Thank you. Uh, today we will talk about mobility from a, or sustainable mobility from a different perspectives. We will talk uh, about what we can do locally and also about some global context. Uh, so the very first uh, speaker is the one who will present the local context of Prague sustainable planning. Václav Novotny. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, good morning for everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Václav Novotny. I work for uh, IPR Prague, uh, which is an uh, organization uh, funded by uh, Prague. Uh, we are expert body for city development, uh, for strategic planning for Prague. We are not the, the real city hall, but we are organization founded by city hall. So we are Prague. Uh, and my office of transport infrastructure uh, is an expert body for uh, infrastructure, uh, transportation infrastructure planning. And we cooperate with uh, City Hall, with uh, city organizations and companies. And uh, we try to, to uh, create a new strategic documents, uh, consultation uh, on new strategic uh, documents. And also we have a transport uh, model uh, office. And uh, we are a part of a uh, work group for uh, Prague uh, Mobility Plan. Uh, my presentation uh, is about the trends, global trends uh, for uh, mobility and the solution, especially for uh, cities, but uh, also in a uh, global. Maybe as uh, you can no, the uh, population of uh, Earth is still growing. Uh, now we are about uh, uh, seven or maybe eight uh, billion, uh, uh, billion of uh, inhabitants on the Earth. And there is a possibility to, to have uh, around 17 uh, billion in 2100. There is also possibility to decrease, but I think uh, it's uh, not the real uh, scenario. Most of people live in Asia uh, and still more and more in uh, Africa. Uh, the, the trend, the progress of, uh, of uh, the inhabitants uh, is still growing, especially in Asia and Africa, but Europe and uh, America is uh, plus minus the same or will be the same or uh, a little bit uh, increasing. Maybe you know that um, the life expectancy is still growing also, so uh, the population is uh, still uh, older and uh, older. You can see on this chart that uh, North America uh, and Europe uh, has the or have uh, the longest uh, longest uh, life expectancy, but uh, Africa not. But the trend is uh, to uh, have uh, longer life uh, expectancy. So uh, that's the reason why the population of the Earth is uh, still uh, growing. Uh, this is a fertility rate, and this is the second uh, re reason that uh, many of uh, emerging uh, emerging uh, uh, state or countries uh, still have the higher fertility rate that, uh, for example, uh, North America or Europe or uh, Russia. Uh, most of people in the Earth live in urban 
areas. You can see the points uh, with the urban areas uh, mm, with uh, more than one million uh, people. And it's true that uh, this number is still increasing from three uh, percent uh, in uh, 1,800 uh, to around 51 uh, or 52 percent uh, these days and uh, will increase uh, to 70 percent perhaps uh, in uh, 2050. You can see uh, these uh, urban areas on uh, the uh, on the maps. Uh, for example, this uh, urban area around the Los Angeles. You can see that the scale is uh, 36 kilometers. This one, and this very uh, interesting and big area is uh, full of uh, housing and. Uh, some paved uh, uh, paved uh, spaces. So this is a bit a problem for the uh, planning uh, because most of people live in this kind of area as uh, is in this chart uh, shown. Uh, for example, uh, in Prague, or uh, it's a global trend, uh, but this chart is uh, from from Prague uh, are from uh, Prague and Prague metropolitan area. Uh, people still uh, buy more and more cars. This uh, red one is for whole Czech Republic, and this blue one is uh, for uh, only for Prague. And you can see that more and more, more people lived in urban areas around the world uh, still uh, buy uh, more and more cars and use more and more cars. It's a performance uh, of the uh, car traffic. And you can see the increasing from uh, in Czech Republic from uh, uh, one, uh, 1990 uh, until to today's. But it's a glo global trend. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's it's a global trend, and that's true. That uh, as a people uh, have more and more cars and use more and more cars. Uh, they uh, travel more and more, uh, so they uh, do uh, more trips in Prague or in Prague metropolitan area. Uh, you can see still more uh, trips per day. Uh, so it's a thousand uh, of uh, trips. Uh, per day in the metropolitan area of uh, Prague. Uh, as we have ma uh, more and more uh, money and more and more le leisure time, uh, we travel and uh, this is a trend of uh, the Prague visitors. This chart shows uh, the Czech resident increasing still increasing not so much but uh, from around the world uh, people travel to Prague and uh, during last five years it's uh, more than 1.5 million visitors per year uh, more so this uh, traveling around the urban areas and in our leisure time uh, consume some energy and uh, produce the uh, carbon dioxide. This is it's this blue line. It's still increasing because we have more trips, more car performance, so we have more energy consumption with uh, more. Uh, produce of uh, carbon di dioxide. This is the concentration of the carbon dioxide uh, on the Earth, so it's uh, connected, and this is a global warming as a result of our uh, producing uh, uh, green uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gases. So uh, the the reason is. Uh, climate change we we know it we know that uh, the reason or, or the consequences is uh, the rising sea levels more intense uh, heat waves more intense rains 
uh, increase uh, the ROS. So mm, the result is uh, shorter fossil fuels party time as we, we have it now. Uh, and we try to uh, have climate change uh, mitigation. Or we could uh, think about it and try to uh, speak about the problems and about the uh, energy consumption. And for example, in Czech Republic, uh, the most of energy consume the car transport. It's this, the uh, highest, uh, highest uh, chart. The second is the airplanes, and it's true that uh, in uh, case of airplanes, there is not so big uh, performance as in uh, car traffic because if you live uh, somewhere in a uh, rural, rural uh, area, it's necessary to, to have a car to, to travel uh, somewhere for, for shopping or for some services and so on. But if we uh, recount it per unit, per uh, power, per uh, persons uh, and kilometer, it's this unit, you can see that uh, the first position uh, for the energy consumption per unit uh, have airplanes for traveling. It's still in the Czech Republic. And the second is the car traffic. That's the reason why it's uh, obvious to travel uh, by plane for longer distances and for the middle uh, distances it's the best way to use uh, uh, trains and uh, now for example we try to have uh, some uh, uh, more uh, train uh, lines in Czech Republic but the infrastructure is full so we, we have uh, so big problems, especially uh, in Prague and around uh, Brno and Ostrava, uh, and try to build a new infrastructure. And this new in infrastructure has to be especially high-speed rail. Uh, and high-speed rail, it's uh, the solution for uh, the distances uh, around 400 or 500 uh, kilometers uh, of, of uh, distance or travel distance. Uh, for example, in Germany, they, they have uh, so big, uh, so, so wide uh, network of high-speed rails. So for example, if uh, you buy a ticket, plane ticket uh, from Prague uh, to uh, Köln, you, uh, will, uh, you could buy a ticket for a uh, plane and then for a high-speed rail uh, because it's much much more shorter and much more uh, sustainable but it's the st it's still one plane ticket but uh, divided uh, into ticket for plane and for train uh, so uh, the, the trends the uh, starting point of the mobility planning in every country it's much more the the same uh, as in Prague, uh, so we face to suburbanization, especially residential. Uh, this is uh, the progress uh, for number of inhabitants uh, of Prague. So you could see the increasing, and this is a uh, uh, increasing of the uh, metropolitan area around the Prague increasing, and uh, you can see that. Uh, the uh, progress is higher in the suburban area. So it means uh, more people will travel by car because it's a longer and we have not in this moment uh, some uh, good rail infrastructure to, uh, to uh, uh, save it. More and more people uh, uh, do more trips, and uh, it means uh, in increasing traffic uh, performance, uh, still more and more pe people buy more uh, automobiles or car traffic uh, modes. 
uh, still more people uh, buy goods uh, via internet and we have also some new trends in a lifestyle in in a society so we face a new technology time a new lifestyle uh, time uh, for everyone and as we know more and more information uh, our processes and uh, planning and implementation and implementation is still more and more complicated so the processes are slower the Consequences is to increase uh, uh, intensity and performance of car traffic and number of uh, passengers, which uh, has a result in infrastructure bottlenecks. As you can see on this uh, picture that there is this yellow problem, uh, problem uh, part of uh, infrastructure, of a car infrastructure in Prague. And uh, the operating costs uh, will or still uh, is increasing. So uh, the financing of the existing infrastructure is uh, unsustainable. Uh, in Prague, we uh, try or it's uh, maybe the same in every uh, city that it's necessary to uh, reform the transportation uh, city management uh, because uh, the processes are uh, much more complicated and different from the last time. But uh, the uh, public uh, uh, is still slower than the uh, private uh, companies, for example. The, the cha changes in the private uh, companies. Uh, in Prague, uh, we have many problems with the model split. You can see that uh, more and more people, especially in the suburban area, this is the suburban area, this is uh, cross bordering uh, trips, use the cars from 2007. Uh, 2015 is increased in two persons. It's not so much, but it's still increasing, and that's the problem. So almost 80 percent of people uh, use cars for uh, commuting to to Prague. And uh, in Prague, uh, it's a positive trend. More and more people uh, use uh, use uh, pedestrian traffic. It's this last blue uh, chart. But uh, more and more people uh, live in suburban area. So on this chart, you can see that uh, still increasing, still increasing uh, number of uh, cross-bordering uh, uh, commuters. So what's the so solution for this uh, situation, for this state of the art? Maybe, uh, maybe you uh, heard about uh, uh, cyclistic infrastructure and uh, cy cyclists. Uh, yes, it's uh, one part of the solution, but uh, not the only solution. Or maybe uh, you heard about uh, uh, some future in a car traffic. Uh, so today we have some uh, congested uh, areas in uh, cities. So the future in for electric cities is the same. Maybe you heard about the shared mobility as a Uber or uh, something like that, but the future is the same. And maybe you heard about the autonomous mobility and the future is the same because uh, our problem is especially uh, the space in the, in the cities uh, besides the environmental and uh, health uh, problems. Uh, you can see some stadium, baseball st stadium in LA. There is the main pitch. Uh, this is the seating for uh, for people, but these people need 
this area for parking their cars. So it's impossible to have this uh, so big spaces uh, in the cities. So uh, the future of the car traffic uh, in the high uh, urbanized areas, it's uh, not so uh, violent. So uh, what is the solution uh, in the global? Uh, to have a connection between, uh, between the modes and to have some strategic documents for uh, possibility to connect uh, every mode into one uh, synergic uh, system. So uh, in cities now we try to uh, have uh, mobility plans, mobility planning uh, process and this uh, sustainable mo mobility plans, it's a strategic plans to satisfy the mobility needs of uh, the citizens, of the visitors, and so on. And the main uh, goal is to have a better quality of life uh, in the city functional areas, not only in the city, but in the whole uh, urban areas. Uh, these mobility plans uh, apply, uh, apply uh, integration integration all modes and all stakeholders into one uh, document and into one process and participate it in this process and to apply evolution to uh, have never ending uh, process not only the document which I mm, have somewhere on, on the shelter but no with no application so the mobility planning uh, is a process, is, is not only one document. Uh, so maybe you heard about some transport strategies, so we could uh, have some uh, sub-system strategies. Uh, and if we connect it into one document, uh, we have a transportation strategy. And if we uh, connect it with uh, some uh, other branches, non uh, transportational, uh, transportational uh, branches as a development, participation, uh, demographic prognosis, environment, or uh, others uh, into one uh, unit, uh, you will uh, get a sustainable mobility plan. Uh, for the mobility planning, we have some methodologies from European Union, from, from uh, Czech Ministry of Transport. Many cities in EU countries uh, have uh, own mobility plan. It's uh, the second, third edition. And now many cities in Czech Republic uh, have a mobility plan. Prague still not. We are still waiting for approval, but uh, we hope it will be uh, very soon. I hope in next month. Uh, mobility plan for Prague uh, is about the reconstruction of existing, uh, especially road infrastructure, but not to build so many new roads. But the backbone of the whole uh, metropolitan area is uh, the rail electric transport and other uh, modes connected to this, this uh, backbone. And also to have uh, Prague uh, freeway auto city ring, and this is the biggest uh, new road of uh, our mobility plan until uh, 2030. And also to have sustainable logistics, uh, less consequences to uh, environment and health uh, from transportation and to have better public space and modern technology in transportation. Maybe you heard about the telematics connectivity uh, of uh, mm, cars, buses and so on to uh, uh, infrastructure and the concept of mobility as a service in which uh, the user, the passenger, uh, have the seamless uh, mobility uh, commuting. So uh, it's uh, mainly about uh, some very good application of uh, an integration all uh, mobility possibilities into one application. 
Uh, as I said, uh, mobility plan, uh, it's about the participation, so it's much more about the people who use the uh, transportation system. So, for example, in Prague, uh, we had some uh, workshops with uh, stakeholders uh, in, every, on, in each part of uh, our process. Uh, this is also with the stakeholders. But also we had uh, some uh, uh, some workshops or some uh, uh, some kind of uh, participation with uh, citizens. So we had some uh, web uh, questionnaire or a sociological survey, panel discussion, exhibition, and so on. And it's very necessary uh, to ask the people. Uh, which uh, is uh, which are they needs, and also uh, half of uh, the success is uh, marketing. Uh, so we try to uh, build some brand. Uh, we uh, had some web page or have some web page still uh, to promote our mo mobility plan on the uh, social uh, media and some announcement in television, radio, and so on. But uh, I think the very important part is uh, to have personalized marketing and influencers. And maybe that's for us and for us, uh, for you and for us, very important, because uh, the culture should or have influencers and should promote the sustainable mobility. Because if, uh, for example, uh, you organized some uh, some uh, transportation uh, or commuting uh, action. Uh, you can promote it uh, via your uh, presence uh, in in uh, culture. So I think it's very very important, and uh, we thank you to promote the sustainable mobility because it's the way how to uh, got the sustainable mob mobility to uh, really uh, citizens and really people. So and what's this uh, mobility, sustainable uh, mobility marketing about? It's an increasing of the space efficiency of transportation. Uh, it's a reducing of the carbon footprint, especially consumption of energy, and increasing uh, performance and reliability. Because, for example, you can know that many people are stuck in uh, some traffic jams in the highways, and they uh, they spend much more time uh, during the years. Uh, the situation is still worse. It's about increasing safety and security, uh, and also about the financial sustainability, which is a bit of problem in the sustainability, uh, uh, sustainable uh, mobility. But we could try to, to say it's more uh, sustainable uh, because of uh, negative consequences, especially uh, for the health and environment. So ex it's an uh, external, uh, external costs and improving uh, human health and environment because if uh, some actor says that uh, the bicycles are great or to use uh, pu public transportation it's uh, not uh, bad uh, it should uh, work and uh, of course improving the accessibility of transport to all so Public transport is uh, try to be more accessible for everybody, uh, and I think uh, that's a very good way to uh, get uh, the transportation, especially public transportation, to everyone. There is some uh, sources if you want, and thank you for your attention. I don't know uh, if there is a, some space for questions, May maybe not. Thank you. And uh, 
now I would like to invite uh, Sandra Kriva from European Cultural Foundation, uh, who will talk about uh, STEP uh, program, uh, which is quite a big inspiration for our program, Go and See. Uh, so uh, I'm really curious to hear about it. Sandra? Thank you very much, Pavora. Um, Hello, good morning everybody. My name is uh, Sandra Griva. I'm working with the European Culture Foundation um, in the Netherlands. We are based in Amsterdam and uh, I'm working there for the STEP Mobility uh, Program as a Grants Administrator. Today I'm going to talk about uh, our green, uh, the implementation of our green strategy into our uh, mobility program. Um, First of all, I'm going to tell you a few words about the European Culture Foundation in case you <laughs> shouldn't have have not heard about us yet. Um, then I'm going to introduce you to the STEP program briefly and then I'm going to explain to you how we developed the idea of a green uh, sustainability strategy in, into our mobility program. So... <laughs> Um, <laughs> the European Culture Foundation is an independent uh, foundation operating uh, on the policy level and advocacy level since 1954. Um, and culture for us is ideally, ideally a channel, an open channel to a dem democratic Europe and especially an inclusive and, uh, Europe of solidarity and uh, freedom. The first initiation of a cultural exchange, of a cultural and, and a creative exchange um, and creative expression was in 1994 um, with the program, so-called Apex Changes program. Um, back then we emphasized st strongly on the establishment of uh, networking contacts uh, between the um, former communist countries in the East and the Western countries. Got it. Before I go into the um, into step itself, I want to introduce you to Azal's project, which has been granted in 2018, uh, which is called "Those Little Things Everybody Knows." Um, she is traveling by bike from Spain to Italy, visiting eight cities uh, within three months. It is a travel of almost 1,500 kilometers, uh, for which she has been receiving 700 euros. Um, her project makes, makes it the most greenest, um, greenest uh, granted mobility project that uh, ever granted in the step, in the step frame. Her um, Azal is um, a refugee um, since uh, she has been uh, fleeing her country, Iran, to live in Italy in 2015. And um, she's a designer and has an architecture background. And uh, through her project, uh, those little things everybody knows, she aims to tackle the um, topic around uh, otherness. Um, she aims to collaborate with uh, eight different um, organizations and um, aims to create space for uh, personal stories through her talk exhibitions. Um, and through shared illustrations and documentation around the topic of otherness. Um, she, on a broader scale, she aims to uh, establish a network of uh, refugee and migra migration artists. So, Azal's project has been um, one of 2,700 projects that we have been granted since um, 2003. STEP uh, stands for uh, Supported Travel for Engaged Partnerships and uh, we award uh, cultural practitioners and uh, artists for the realization of, um, of their projects in the cooperation with a partner organization across Europe and its neighboring countries. So um, we aim to give an incentive, uh, we have been established in 2003, how, um, the way I mentioned it already, and um, the main incentive for the establishment of STEP was actually to give an incentive for cultural cohesion 
beyond uh, the European Union countries in response to e the EU enlargement back then to the East in 2004. Um, to give you a short idea on um, on step in a statistical in a statistical um, uh, frame, in 2018 we have been uh, granting 358 um, gra uh, grantees and projects, which has been a pivotal year for step. Um, our grants or let's say it like this, our applications doubled in 2018 compared to 2017. Um, our top 10 departure countries, you can say here, um, of which the United Kingdom, very interestingly, has been our uh, record, uh, application, um, record application destination country. So we received 93 applications to uh, depart from the United Kingdom within the European sphere, of which 56 projects have been granted. Um, this has been closely followed uh, by recep reception of 80 applications for Germany, um, the Netherlands, and then Italy. For the, our Czech uh, constituency, we received, um, or let's say it another way, we granted eight uh, step projects um, yearly since 2015, um, holding different nationalities and uh, traveling to countries like Poland and uh, Jordan. Coming to the core message of my presentation, um, the issue around climate change has been an emergency since many, many years already. In 2000, um, we started thinking about the idea of implementing a strategy already in 2009, 2010. 2010 marked uh, our um, 15 years, our 10 years uh, anniversary for STEP, which we took as an opportunity to change our guidelines uh, into a more um, greener direction. So basically what happened was we, that we detected the urgency to, urgency to uh, counteract on the global issue with uh, higher stimulation with train travel. Since uh, the step travel grant scheme has always been a highly polluting um, grant scheme uh, because of of course mostly uh, most grantees has, have also been traveling by airplane. Um, social change have also has also been has uh, sorry social change change has al always been um, high on the agenda of the step travel grant scheme. As uh, Ada Wong, former member of the Culture and Heritage um, Commission, already said um, that the cultural sector is a natural change agent and it should be perceived like that, especially by us, the um, cultural foundations. It is an instigator and provocateur in the paradigm shifts and mindset changes. So we took this as a possibility that we can change something through a granting program and through enabling the possibility to travel within the European sphere and its neighboring countries. To grasp the development or um, yeah, the development of a green strategy, we have to understand where we uh, took it off from our former guidelines. Our guidelines changed, um, increasing, uh, changed very strongly uh, since 2011. Back then, we were focusing on um, on a categorization uh, around European neighborhood uh, regions, which which you can see here. So, um, according to varying regions, as um, the European Union and EFTA countries, um, then, so basically we awarded grants in between these five categorization countries. Uh, Intra-travel in between European countries, uh, countries was not allowed back then because we were strongly promoting on the possibility to enhance, as I said, the cultural cohesion between uh, cultural um, between country regions. So um, we focused on the European Union as a country group, then um, the Western Balkans, <laughs> um, the MUBR countries, how we called it back then, the Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, and so on. 
um, South Caucasus countries, uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and um, North African countries. I want to introduce the analysis of our uh, of the green strategy by uh, taking the example of the travel between Zagreb, Budapest, as a short distance um, opportunity to travel, and uh, Zagreb and Amsterdam as a country connect connection as an example for long distance travel. Um, so we took the analysis from here because we said a short distance is in our two um, immediate neighboring countries. Back then Zagreb was uh, part of our Western Balkans group and um, Budapest of our European Union group. Um, the long distance travel was taken as an idea um, to, to see um, to, to see the longest or one of the longest distances in between Euro uh, from one European point to another in the north. So this took us. So for the 2011 guidelines, in this case, both distances, um, Zagreb Budapest and Zagreb Amsterdam, would have been awarded with a 400 euros grants, no matter the transportation type t uh, taken. Um, from here, we took the analysis to so we took the analysis to EcoPassenger. Uh, for those who haven't heard of EcoPassenger yet, it's, uh, it is a, a very straightforward, simple tool to um, a calculation tool to compare um, the ec the ecological footprint um, uh, regarding or according to transporta transportation methods used. Um, so, for the, let's start with the short distance example. The short distance Zagreb Budapest connection would have been a 300 uh, is a 350 kilometer distance. Um, for our train example, this would have cost 14 or almost 15 kilogram CO2 emissions for um, for a duration of six hours. Compared to um, our airplane travel, this would have been immensely higher, of course, with 64 kilograms CO2 emissions with a, a half um, duration uh, in the time period traveled. Of course, the tr uh, um, price, incre price difference is again quite immensely, as you can see here. But um, from the environmental, uh, per, um, environmental aspect, um, this resulted in a three-fourth uh, less carbon dioxide emission for the train travel than the airplane travel. So, um, quite a huge difference. Um, for the long distance, uh, long distance example, of course, we again have a high uh, difference in emissions, which is quite um, obvious and clear. Um, the distance um, is 1,000 kilometers more for the longer distance. And um, again, this would have been, as I said, 400 euro ground again. Um, but here, the very crucial aspect that we have to strongly consider is, of course, the time difference, obviously. Um, per airplane, um, uh, a tra travel distance of 1,300 kilometers would have been a uh, four-hour trip and, uh, back then. And per train, uh, this would have been increasingly more. So um, this would... This is, of course, one of the main reasons our grantees always um, decided to go uh, and travel by plane, airplane, just to save time and have more time for a project implementation in the destination country. So we took these numbers and this, um, and this specific example and established according to, um, to this reason um, New new categorizations, which framed in a way that we uh, categorized instead of uh, country regions, we went and um, distributed our um, our grant amounts according to kilometer groupings: short distance, medium distance, and long distance. Um, long distance, of course, this is not a very specific long distance, but taken the European sphere, we can say that this is a long distance uh, trip, 1500 kilometers and more, since this is our constituency um, that we are tackling. Um, so, 
basically what happened was um, that for the same uh, trip uh, between Amsterdam and um, Budapest, for example, we would have granted um, back then a 400 euro grant. But taking the airplane between Budapest and Zagreb, we would actually now not fund an airplane travel anymore. Uh, simply to make the statement that the train travel is completely um, perceivable for this short distance of 350 kilometers, also take, taking into consideration a longer, um, longer time period. Um, while we would have been funding uh, this trip for 400, 400 euros, now this would be a 250 euro grant. Um, and Another challenge that we also, of course, perceived, as I said already, already, is a time issue, obviously. And another challenge, a second one that we uh, tackled was um, was a low infrastructure in uh, many of our regions that we funded. For example, um, yeah, lower developed uh, countries with a low infrastructure. This would have been um, also a point or a reason. Grantees would obviously choose the airplane instead of the train to travel to the destination country just simply because train travel would have been less feasible. So this is also one of the reasons we don't allow um, funding per airplane anymore just to um, promote, um, we don't allow uh, airplane travel up to 700 kilos, uh, kilometers anymore, simply to um, simply to promote the idea of train travel, especially uh, in between European neighboring countries. So, what uh, the major difference between back then our guidelines and now is obviously that we also allow intra-European travel simply because there was also the demand of our constituency within the European Union sphere um, and not only uh, to allow the travel in between our neighboring countries and the European Union uh, as a political entity. So basically the main difference is now that for the same distance we would grant um, 200 euro more for the train travel than by airplane travel. So what happened um, in the past two years, since we have been strongly implementing this strategy in 2017, is um, that the train travel got more popular and uh, grantees were perceiving the opportunity to receive a high amount for the same distance as, for example, compared uh, airplane travel as uh, very positive. But on the other hand, Grantees were also telling us that it is just simply not realizable. Um, the ideals of, a, of environmental sustain sustainability within our projects and the pragmatic reality um, we are living in. It's just not feasible to approach this, um, this environmentally um, protecting um, strategy for them. On the positive note, again, uh, grantees were actually happy to um, take the train simply because their project already started by entering the train. They were reflecting on their work progress. They were um, perceiving the uh, chance to actually get into contact with the hum uh, humane um, uh, co-travelers and um, already uh, involved these into their projects. Um, train travel, unfortunately, compared to 2017, decreased in 2018. Um, this can be due to different trends, which uh, we have not scientifically um, researched, uh, but of course I personally observed, and many of you observed the trend, that um, airplane deals are just getting cheaper while train travels um, are sometimes increasing or staying the same. Um, so in 2018 we had a 53 success rate. Um, uh, 53 success rate in uh, granting applications, um, which was 7% higher than 2017. So um, this is also a reason why airplane travel was probably just simply higher, because um, also yeah more people just travel by airplane. 
As for uh, our external environment, we were, um, in order to developing on the green strategy much more, um, we have been collaborating or working together with uh, Julie's Bicycle, which is, um, which is yeah, a platform um, and a collective uh, working on the area around sustaining, um, sustaining creativity. And uh, we have been using their, um, their IG tool, which is a, um, an online tool to um, compare uh, the ecological footprint made uh, during uh, mobility. And on another no note, we have been, or my former colleague has been part of the Creative uh, Climate Leadership um, Group. Um, on a last note, um, I think the reason or um, one important aspect that we noticed um, around the green sustainability strategy is um, that implementing the strategy on an external sphere is uh, not enough to fully be, uh, fully be a valid representative of a su sustainability strategy. Um, the European Culture Foundation has been, there has been an initiative of, of a working group to also implement a sustainability strategy within in-house into our staff structure and into our organizational cultural structure. Unfortun <coughs> unfortunately, this has not been um, fully implemented yet. We are still working on it, but um, what I'm trying to say is that um, to start doing something about sustainability externally, we have to start doing something about su su sustainability internally. This starts with um, finding solutions, alternative solutions um, for the traveling mode of our staff members, for example. So maybe also avoiding short conference travels and maybe going instead uh, to an online conferences. Um, on further extent, we have been implementing on a very small scale uh, sustainability methods uh, within um, our un other granting program, the Tandem Collaboration uh, Program, where this has been uh, realized uh, through, for example, um, for example, uh, collaborating with social enterprises du during uh, workshops. And for our next steps, um, we are currently in in a change um, in a change in the in a structural change within our organization, which uh, where also um, a new strategy will probably come along with it, but we are pr currently working on that. And for now, I want to thank you and um, yeah, give the word back to you. Thank you, Sandra. Any quick questions? Uh, we will meet again in about 20 minutes after coffee, uh, so maybe not now. Okay, so let's have 20 minutes break. Thank you. Uh, thanks to our keynote speakers and to see you in 20 minutes for a panel discussion. Thank you. So still morning, so good morning, everybody. Uh, we are back here for a panel discussion. Uh, yes, everybody is seated. So uh, you met two of our panelists before. Uh, so Václav, you've already met Václav. So I will introduce you, Jiří Vrček, who is from the Ministry for Regional Development. And uh, he is uh, coordinator of the, of the program Partnership for uh, Urban Planning Project. Okay, and then we have Jaroslav Pašmik, uh, who is the head of the uh, Sustainability Management uh, Department at Center uh, at the Oco Economic <laughs> University here in Prague. Then we have Sandra, who gave us this brilliant presentation in the morning. And we have here Fatima Avila from uh, Asian Europe Foundation. She's the project coordinator of Mobility First program. And then we have here our Secretary General, Marie Lesur, uh, who is... Um, in a charge of uh, on the move network and uh, she's been dealing with uh, issues of mobility for more than 10 years already uh, this session should be as open as possible because most of you have some experience with uh, mobility uh, with 
many aspects or in many aspects so we would like to make it as open as possible so please take it as a Q&A session um, and do ask questions we have here a girls with microphones that uh, will help you to join us it's necessary to use microphones because we uh, are online so please respect it and uh, okay let's start um, maybe I would like to ask Mari for an opening word, since she's a Secretary General of On The Move and has longest experience in this. So, uh, Mari, uh, we've heard presentations in the morning. Uh, what are your first responses to sustainability and mobility? Uh, what, what kind of issue is it for you? Uh, oh, you have to turn it on? No, I think it's okay, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, I, would, yeah, I would start while saying that I started to work um, with On The Move uh, in 2012 and uh, one of the first uh, projects we have been working on was uh, a guide uh, which was not a guide on uh, mobility funding because On The Move is a mobility information network and we signpost information about funding opportunities for the mobility of artists and cultural professionals but this guide was very specific on this sustainability issue so it was a uh, uh, a uh, the Green Mobility Guide for the Performing Arts Sector. And we uh, co-produce uh, this guide uh, together with uh, Julie's Bicycle that you mentioned, so which is this uh, UK-based agency which uh, advises uh, the arts and cultural sector into greening their practices. And uh, this guide has been uh, very uh, popular. Uh, so it provides like, tips, advice, uh, particularly like, for dance, theatre company, artists, cultural professionals to have more like, uh, you know, like to, uh, to, to consider like more like sustainable type of touring or also like to consider like producing the set uh, in the venue uh, where, for instance, they are invited instead of, you know, having like um, bringing all the material for the, for the performance. And this guide has been uh, translated in various languages, including in Germany, uh, in German, sorry, uh, together with uh, touring artists, IGBK and ITI, and it's even translated in Chinese. So we got also like some feedback uh, from uh, Chinese artists and cultural professionals. And since then, we have been uh, trying to engage uh, on this issue at various levels of competencies, uh, so through uh, signposting information, uh, for instance, uh, on mobility opportunities which are related to this question of environmental uh, sustainability through residency program, for instance, and uh, also at a policy level, so we are part of different European uh, projects, and one of the latest is the Creative Climate uh, Leadership uh, Program. Um, I just would like maybe to share uh, three main ideas, and I think maybe it can, you know, um, uh, connect also like through to the experience of uh, on the move member, because as you say, we are a network, and a lot of experience is also coming from our uh, member. Uh, one thing, it's like, um, of course, any type of travel that we are involved with uh, has an impact on the environment, but it's also not only about. Uh, the question of the travel, but it's what we do also like when we are at the destination. So it's also this question of trying to optimize our coming or, you know, like travel as much as possible. So uh, we try as much as possible not to go, you know, abroad only for one meeting, but to optimize every time our travel. So we try to, to limit on that. Um, and um, we, uh, we, we also think, and we are not the only one to think about that, that this debate uh, should be very much at an uh, international scale. Here we are more in a European, I mean, we have our guests uh, from the Asia Europe Foundation. We have also some, uh, some uh, uh, members and participants from the US. But um, every time you have this uh, question raised also at a more international level, it's where the debate and the action also become more interesting and relevant for this global uh, challenge that we are facing and here I am referring to uh, one IETM meeting uh, that we attended a few years ago in uh, Melbourne in Australia and uh, it was a session on uh, greening practices for the arts and cultural sector and uh, there were guests from Europe but also from Southeast Asia and from Australia and so it was like trying to find ways to green our practices and um, 
I mean, at a certain point of the conversation, there were people, particularly from Southeast Asia, from uh, Indonesia and from uh, Thailand, for instance, and Cambodia, who say, like, yeah, it's a very interesting topic, but at the end of the day, it's a very luxurious position in which you are, because you have the money to travel, so you have also the choice uh, to choose or not to choose to go somewhere. You have the opportunity, it's like, you know, you don't need a visa, uh, because yeah, it was more like with uh, some European uh, people, so you know, like this question of free movement of uh, travel. And at the end of the day, uh, we don't have these opportunities, like in most of the country in Southeast Asia. And the global, uh, the climate change, it's really much our, at our feet, you know, at our door. So it was also interesting, and I will just finish on that. But to have very much this debate on what we do on this question of mobility, impact, and the relation with the arts and cultural sector, to have also this debate on an international scale. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe Fatima, would you like to comment on it, since uh, Marie was talking about Asian experience. So, uh, and we also heard presentation about European context. So, uh, what about Asian Europe Foundation and its uh, green mobility approach? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm from the Asia Europe Foundation. We're in, maybe one minute just to uh, tell you who we are and what we do because uh, I'm sure not everyone knows. So we're, we're an intergovernmental organization um, that's funded by 50 countries in Asia and Europe. So this is our jurisdiction, our mandate, but we are based in um, Singapore. It's the only office. And um, we, it, culture, it's not a cultural foundation in a sense. It's, uh, culture is one of the six main thematic areas that we do. And in the area of culture, we have a mobility grant, we have uh, an event series, we do publications, and one of which is um, what we call the Creative Responses to Sustain Sustainability series, which maps um, arts organizations that, uh, that, um, that do things related to climate change and the environment and so on. But in terms of mobility, and we, we, we run a mobility grant, it is, of course, a very, very different context from um, ECF and, um, and uh, intra-Europe travel where um, from your brilliant presentation, your longest um, distance is probably our shortest. <laughs> so we fund artists and cultural professionals to travel between the two regions, and it will always, always be more than 700 um, kilometers. So, and um, we, we fund Asia to Europe, Europe to Asia, and intra-Asia travel. And intra-Asia travel is not at all comparable to intra-Europe travel because of um, infrastructure. It's not connected in one piece of land. The train system doesn't exist in most, in most places. And um, it's very disconnected um, with water. So anyway, we cannot um, disregard um, plane travel um, at all. It will always be there. But we are an, an organization that is aware of, of the negative impact of, of um, plane travel. So I guess in, in the way that we promote mo mobility, it would be the awareness of how to make mobility more more responsible and on the level of let's say because let's say as a there are many levels like we need innovations i just came from a mobility conference in in Ljubljana a few weeks ago and it was also a very burning topic there that you know different sectors have to work together to to build a more sustainable mobility so in on the level of let's say, even the artist um Will you accept an invitation to have a one-off performance in a festival? Or like in our grant, in our application form, we ask for the, the um, event dates and the travel dates. So in a way, we are implicitly encouraging what we slow travel. So if you go from Europe to Asia, you have to maximize it and um, do as many things as possible in that, in that one like mobility opportunity. And same way for the other way around on the level of small arts organizations, because we also, we accept applications from our organizations. We are aware that there is, you know, it's a difficult way to balance, um, you know, the, the budget and, and sustainability. On the level of um, information points and information providers for, for, uh, for mobility, there is also like a, a responsibility to, to, to give information in a more uh, responsible way. And, on the higher level of policy and uh, and infrastructure and um, innovations in technology, there you know different people have to do different things, and um, yeah, we, we we want to be more aware of everything. Thank you. 
Uh, Sandra, we've heard your presentation, so we know uh, what your agenda is. But my question is, since the more sustainable mobility requires systematic changes, do you also work with authorities to create some um, dialogue uh, in what you in like spreading the message you want to to send to the world of artists and to communicate it to authorities? Um, in that specific context, uh, we haven't started any conversation into that direction. Uh, the only external entities that we have been uh, working with uh, was the uh, climate uh, leadership um, uh, platform that uh, we have been attending and um, Julie's Bicycle around which we have been attending various conferences and uh, of course debates and conversations around the topic um, but it didn't went further than that for now. I think one um, the ideal vision of, of the next uh, step for step would be um, actually to um, also go into the direction of um, intra-Europe uh, railway deals with uh, specific companies. To, so to actually have an intra-sectorial um, yeah, cooperation um, yeah, to initiate this kind of um, direction. But yeah, we went, didn't okay. went further than that. Thank you. I mentioned that your uh, grant program is quite inspiration for uh, Arts and Theatre Institute because uh, Pavel Petrova already mentioned it, that Go and See program for the first time uh, included this requirement on sustainability that we yes. we don't fund uh, uh, trips by plane shorter than 700 kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So we kind of followed your uh, yeah, example. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. And um, actually, uh, we already read in the in the applicants that people were or grantees were. Uh, responding to it, they were reacting and making comments on it, and they were choosing different types of mobility. Yeah. So um, we were quite happy about the message we sent to them. And uh, uh, as a part of the registration form for the conference, but was a short questionnaire uh, where we asked about uh, people's experience with sustainable mobility, and the results were quite poor. Uh, it shows that Czech Republic is very at the very beginning of this conversation, so we see this meeting as a kind of a first step, and we would like to uh, share this uh, ideas or come up with a minimum what we can do in a culture or with the tips what we can do uh, to make mobility more sustainable, both for authorities or a funding um, funding programs and for artists. And um, we have uh, Jaroslav Pashmik here from the. Uh, from the Sustainability uh, Management Center. Yes, uh, I find your agenda quite uh, interesting. Uh, do you also work with uh, culture field uh, and sustain, say, sustainable mobility in a culture field? And could you please introduce your agenda? Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. I'm very fond of this kind of conference. Uh, actually, I'm. Uh, I work at the University of Economics in Prague, uh, at the Faculty of Business Administration, and um, I run there uh, it's a course called Sustainability Management, and it's an elective. Uh, it's, it's actually the first course in this country uh, on sustainability management, and also the Center for Sustainability Management, what we have there, uh, is the first one. So yes, we are on the beginning. We are, we are just lagging behind uh, a little bit. Uh, behind the, the Western countries, uh, maybe maybe 20 years, but uh, maybe maybe a little bit more. Uh, so, um, what is the agenda? Actually, I try to create or help uh, create agents for change in organizations, uh, which change organization from into more sustainable organizations. And in this uh, course, I have uh, people from different uh, fields, also from uh, uh, culture management, uh, or uh, arts management, actually. And uh, um, I myself, I'm uh, first university which I studied is, was musicology, and I'm also, besides the business administration uh, university, I'm also a musician, or I used to be. So I know, I, I some kind of connect those two, uh, two spheres as business, working more with the, or actually, predominantly with big corporations, uh, solving problems in big corporations, helping to solve the problems. So, and, and the mobility actually is, uh, 
before I never thought about it as a, as a cultural phenomenon before that you somehow brought it, uh, the, the topic into the light. And I think it's really, we can, we can uh, think about mobility as a cultural phenomenon actually. And uh, economy can be also seen as, as a cultural phenomenon, right? It's kind of like that. It, and, 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 and arts is a part of, of our society. So it's very hard to kind of separate it because as we saw uh, in your presentation here, actually we can look on this through management um, glasses, through economy, economy glasses, and we can see uh, that there is like, uh, there is a aspect of, of efficiency, which actually looks like that it's to, to travel sustainably is not efficient, right? Because all those uh, sustainable travels uh, were more costly, like it cost more. So it's like something is really weird. Uh, and um, of course, it's it's because the uh, system of economy economic economy is not a, a free market uh, is is not perfect. There is lots of uh, uh, externalities which are not kind of included into into the price. So yeah, uh, I try to work on this with big corporations. I have students from uh, from culture sector which work on different projects. For instance, here in Prague, uh, also on mobility, how to uh, how to change certain big streets into more quiet uh, streets, uh, for instance, uh, or how to change Prague into more sustainable uh, city, which is very, very, very demanding. And uh, I look uh, on this through the economics, uh, economists' uh, glasses, through the perspective of, of, of efficiency, but also, also not only efficiency, but also through strategy of sufficiency and maybe through strategy of consistency, where you uh, brought into, uh, into the sphere um, something more than than uh, economic efficiency which is not actually working now uh, okay i'll get back to you maybe later on with some further questions but maybe now we can finish the round and uh, maybe uh, yuri Vlček can introduce his project of uh, partnership uh, it's a eu project uh, how do you deal with sustainability how do you relate to this and what is um, you're representing a ministry for a regional development so is a green mobility uh, at the top of your agenda somehow or is it ne neglected uh, yeah <laughs> uh, it is and uh, three years ago um, let me introduce you myself to yourself <laughs> uh, I started with mobility three years ago I, I didn't even know there is something called urban mobility but now it's the major part of my work. Uh, this uh, project, uh, maybe this is this is funny that some people call it a program, others call it a project, and officially it's called a partnership. Uh, th this this says something. Uh, we um, this is a kind of um, initiative. The cities, European cities, came up with. Uh, to all together with uh, member states to persuade the European Commission to do more for the cities and uh, this there are 12 topics uh, under this umbrella agenda the agenda is called urban agenda for the EU and we are trying to achieve some mm, tangible uh, results uh, deliverable goals uh, and then mm, we we refer to the uh, international or uh, United Nations new urban agenda. So you see the big umbrellas and we are in Europe and what's, what's the contributions of the cities and member states and many uh, umbrella organizations from Brussels mostly. One of them uh, abbreviated ECF. So it's not only yours, it's also European Cyclist Federation. Uh, we have them on board and we have uh, Organizations like Polis, they, they deal with uh, municipalities. We have UITP, public transport, it's a French abbreviation. Uh, we have Eurocities, and with all of these, we, mm, we, uh, we are co-coordinators with the German city of Karlsruhe, uh, and we, 
with this project, we we um, we ask ourselves at the beginning, what are the major uh, challenges, issues in the field of mobility in Europe? So the cities, the umbrella organizations, and the member states, there's also five member states on board. So you can imagine this kind of big uh, consortium, project consortium, and uh, there is, for example, a me member from Cyprus, and look at their uh, challenges. Uh, there is somebody from uh, from Finland. Uh, there is people from. Uh, there's an organization called Walk, Walk 21 dealing with uh, walking as a major issue. And with with all of these, we try to define uh, some kind of actions we want to uh, work. We are working on uh, and deliver some results uh, with the help of an action plan. Uh, we have the action plan, y you, you can all uh, read it, have it, uh, and in the end of this year we call it end of project, but it's a partnership approach. So it means um, the, all the partners uh, ha got to know each other, uh, set a working relationship, multi-level, uh, multi-governance, very, very tough, very challenging. Uh, <laughs> Many of, of us never spoke to such levels, like from national to uh, city level, or uh, I've never, before I, I didn't know that somebody's dealing with uh, walking as a major issue. Uh, so I think the main aim of this project, maybe later on we, we may call it program, I don't know, is, is to give the European cities uh, more chance to, to improve quality of life, to make uh, mobility uh, more sustainable. Uh, of course, we w we won't uh, we won't achieve um, uh, all the goals. But uh, the aim is to really make uh, these entities cooperate with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think this is the contribution also from our ministry, which is in charge of this project uh, on, on behalf of Czechia, our oh, the national coordinator, national contact point. Thank you. That's enough for the introduction, I think. We've heard the presentation, but uh, I must still ask, uh, do you think uh, it's, it's working, the communication between respective ministries, since you are, your body um, is uh, um, the IPR and uh, the planning office, uh, do they take your advice? What about the implementations across the various levels of a government and uh, all those players we've heard is quite, uh, quite there, there are many players and it's complicated, all those layers of authority. So what about the synergy between them? How does it work? Uh, it depends, but I think the communication between uh, ministry uh, ministries uh, and us, for example, uh, it it worked. But uh, we have so many strategies that in it's impossible to go together and uh, make some very good implementation of of this. So, in my opinion, the problem uh, is not uh, in a strategy and not so much in a cooperation, but in an application. Mm -hmm. So, at the municipality level, or for example, if uh, we have some strategy, let's uh, make it uh, alive uh, in in the reality, but not only on uh, in uh, on the paper. So mm, that's the main problem. So I you think. think it's not that difficult to create a strategy, but it's difficult to implement it in yeah, reality. Definitely, right? definitely. Okay, that was as a starting introduction of our panel. But let's take it more as an open Q and A. Uh, so please uh, join us. Do you have some questions or comments on what you've heard during the morning? Uh, keynote presentations. Yes. Um. Thank you. Okay, so we have a problem. We are using too many cars and we're using too many airplanes. Uh, we could look at it in a number of different ways. We could do more, you know, put more pressure on the car manufacturers and on the airplane manufacturers and also where I live in Italy, uh, on the cruise ship manufacturers to produce machines that pollute less. That would be one way. Uh, another way is to look at our own practices. 
in the contemporary performing arts at least, we've spent at least 20, 30 years uh, promoting mobility because we really believe that human to human contact is extremely important, not only in the arts, but really to understand one another. With the rise in nationalism, it becomes even more important. So my question is, knowing that we believe in this human to human contact, but knowing that it's problematic, at, at least at the moment, because of the machines that we need. Has anybody been working on really trying to use internet technologies, which of course pollute as well, but I don't have the information to know which is worse, but has anybody been looking at um, ways to, to really try to make these possibilities to connect via internet more intimate, more personal, I mean, I give a, a brief example. Um, I'm asked to teach in a number of different places, and what I'm doing now is is I'm uh, I'm taping a lecture and then uh, giving the lecture, or introducing the lecture on Skype, letting the, um, the the classes look at my taped video and then um, coming back onto Skype again, for example. But in order to get the benefit of really trying to emulate the human to human contact, a half an hour lecture and uh, you know, half an hour Skype won't do. We need to find ways to hang out in the, in the bar together you know, and really have small talk conversations and really spend as much time together. Who's working on that? I'd be very interested. So is somebody working on that? Yuri, you would like to comment on it? Or Yaroslav maybe as well? Maybe uh -huh. just partly uh, my <laughs> little contribution would be that uh, I realized that the only maybe mm, the only chance where I uh, get connected via a webinar to to the rest of Europe uh, dealing with some interesting issues like resilient resi uh, city uh, is is this way of uh, organizing webinars with web cameras if necessary uh, and not organize things in one place. So I do it just once in two weeks. I, I join in and I'm, I'm happy this is organized by JPI Europe. Uh, they deal with urban issues. Um, it's, it's run from, I think, Vienna or, or they have speakers from all, all the Europe. So this is the only uh, opportunity for me. Otherwise, I'm sometimes questioning myself, why do I have to travel there to Brussels, say, uh, once a month? Why don't we uh, deal with um, issues, uh, daily issues with the European institutions just per Skype or per uh, with other uh, technology uh, um, instruments? This is a question for me. Uh, yes. I don't have the answer. Thank you. Yaroslav, would you like to comment on it? How technology can help? Uh, and well, I think it's a, it's a cultural issue, isn't it, right? That uh, we are used to uh, personal contacts and uh, it's uh, human, de human development somehow uh, that uh, uh, we, we still use our bodies, right, uh, to move around. And of course, yeah, then we hop on train or hop on plane. And the problem is that, yeah, that's... Um, the technology would be developed, and I'm not talking about internet, I'm talking about planes, uh, and the system uh, of uh, taxation, for instance, would be developed, it doesn't, doesn't somehow readdress the, the problem of sustainability. And uh, when this is the, uh, somehow addressed, this problem of taxation, for instance, because as you know, probably the kerosene is not actually taxed, so that's why it is so, so cheap and it looks like it's efficient, but it's not, actually, because it's not taxed. So, uh, look for a, uh, for Chicago Convention in 1944. So, uh, so um, uh, I think that it's, it's not really possible to uh, fully um, somehow um, or, or, or maybe I know already for 10 years that, uh, that there are, for example, com companies like Cisco, they are developing really like uh, video conferencing uh, technologies, uh, very, very well suited for big corporations which uh, have, to, have to uh, have a virtual organizations. For, of course, it's, 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 it's normal 
in in corporate world that you uh, work uh, with Bangalore, with the South Africa, you know, with with New York. That it's it's, it's normal uh, that you do it, and um, so the technology is already there, and uh, the those uh, virtual team work. We have many service centers here in, in the Czech Republic of, of uh, multinational companies sitting in in the uh, in offices, but uh, um, I don't know if it works for for culture for for uh, for this kind of uh, creative meeting. For instance, my good friend Mirek Srnka, which is the one of the uh, mo most uh, uh, I would say most known Czech composers composed uh, opera called South Pole, right? Uh, very successful opera. Uh, um, and the librettist was from, from Australia. And he had to travel to Australia somehow. They, they had to meet, to, to work together, to, uh, to work on the libretto and then the, um, and actually to, to make, make it into music, into opera. So it's, it's kind of, a, I'm, an, 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 and maybe not that much imaginable that it would, it would really, this creative process would be possible without uh, this this human physical contact with some kind of very advanced, uh, uh, for instance, I don't, I don't know what kind of virtual uh, virtual room, mm -hmm. right? I don't know any of those. Uh, uh, Experiments. Maybe you know some experiments where it, it already does. I know what only what I know is the uh, metropolitan, uh, uh, like mad opera, like transmitting, you know, all, all around the globe, right? The, the 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 great operas, which is actually better to see uh, in the in the cinema than there in the opera. I was there watching the the opera, then I watched it here, and it was much much better to watch it here actually than than, than in mad, right? Because you had inside in the that you have details which you you don't have. Of course, it's something very different, you know. But the creative process can it be can it be somehow virtualized? I'm not sure. Yes, Fatima, please. Um, yes, uh, related to that, I completely agree with with Marianne. Um, we believe that face to face encounters are still the the, the best way to understand um, each other's cultures and. As a strong supporter of cultural mobility, we obviously encourage this um, through through the grant, so people actually meet each other in person and co-produce and, and collaborate. And But in our other projects, like for instance, our conversation series, we have one coming up, I was just talking to Lee about it. Um, it will be in Singapore, and it's about um, producing networks and, and so on. And we're bringing together uh, three representatives of producing networks. And one is like very new one. One is a mid one, which is like 15 years from from Korea. Anyway, the third speaker is from from the UK, and this conversation will be a maximum like three hours in Singapore. But the the contributions from the from our British speaker will be invaluable because you know it's like you have a emerging one, a mid one, and a very mature organization. Question is, do we fly her over for three hours in in Singapore? Um, so. She's not coming over, and um, technology now is very, very uh, advanced, and uh, we, we will do it uh, pre-recorded, like a um, video call uh, with the questions, and we'll edit it, and she will be there, and um, it will be live. She will be live also to, to answer questions, but experimenting with uh, these kinds of things um, shouldn't hinder the exchange of ideas and uh, the sharing of, of best practices. When we talk about mobility, it's also not just physical mobility, but the, the mobility of, of, of ideas. And we should experiment on the ways of how to um, exchange. And uh, so we're, we're trying to, to do this now. And um, yeah, and also other, other ways. Um, Anno, yes, please, Yaroslav. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, second or third that idea. Um, that human connection is necessary to actually um, collaborate and make projects happen in many, many cases. Uh, this is also the, the breathing point of step to actually enable this um, collaboration face to face because otherwise the project wouldn't get to the next level in a lot of cases. Um, one way we try to um, 
one idea would be to, where we could maybe circumvent this um, yeah, the, the issue of a short traveling, for example, of traveling for one two-day conference uh, for a networking event to another country would be uh, a to actually prohibit this um, possibility to go actually for a conference travel. But on another side, this would also prohibit uh, idea creation or uh, networking meetings or meetings of new connections for our grantees. So taking on from there, we could also say, okay, how about you go to this conference, but also connect it to uh, another project init initiation with respective people you meet there, or maybe with or partner organizations that are in this area, and only allowing from there um, sh um, short-term travel that starts from five or seven days or 15 days. So this would be one way to um, more promote even uh, this uh, green, green travel. Um, on a completely other note, STEP has been always promoted as a grant program in order to also reach our peripheries because we have been very popular, of course, in metropolitan cities to travel to and from metropolitan cities as Berlin, Paris and so on. Um, in order to reach also peripheries, we have been also traveling to these peripheries in the past and we're doing workshops about application, filling in and so on. And this evolved, luckily, into um, simply webinars, which is a very popular tool, I think, just to reach a, a big, big target group in a very small um, time and economic efficiency, which is um, one involvement that I can positively report on. Um, yeah. Can I add one thing? Maybe one request, because I, I have to apologize, I will have to go uh, a little bit earlier uh, because I have some other uh, important meeting uh, but uh, I'm very very uh, glad that I hear this kind of thinking about sustainability in in mobility in, in in culture I wish that guys from uh, manufacturers of uh, of uh, airplane engines could hear that and uh, because, as as you know, maybe the airplane engines uh, they are they are designed to last maybe twenty, maybe thirty years, right? So the engines which are now designed, which are new, will be here for twenty years, right? Because before they will actually be paid and they will kind of retire, so. <laughs> I work with those companies which produce engines for aircrafts and they don't go for, for instance, electric engine. They still develop petrol kerosene based engines. So if they would if there would be kind of more pressure from customers, from uh, uh, frequent flyers that they really have to change. I think that they will have to change more. Uh, like, uh, probably their business model will not be fulfilled because they, they develop certain things which will we will not be allowed to use if we want to change as, a, as we, as is actually uh, now in IPCC uh, documents actually uh, clear that we have to change in 10 or 15 years very radical way. So it means that those engines probably will never fly, or they will have to somehow kind of like be completely overhauled, right? So I'm very glad that I hear this discussion, but I think that because we need to travel to create, right, to exchange ideas, so I think that we have to really create a pressure, more pressure on those producers of, of, of engines or the airlines, actually, because it will not happen when the kerosene is very, very uh, cheap. It will not happen if the people will not care about this, uh, right? And as a center of oh, as a sustainable sustainability management at the Economica University, somehow planning to take part in this pressure on a. We, I'm doing it already for years. Uh, but it's just it's, it's personal conversation, right? It's what, what it's, it's, it's personal conversation ways? with top managers of those companies, 
right? And they say, okay, or if you can sometimes read it not only with the with the producers of uh, of uh, uh, airplane engines, but also with producers of cars. Read the maybe one or two years old uh, sustainability reports where they say diesel will be here for for another another twenty years maybe because we don't have any uh, anything else than diesel, right? So and then maybe you know this uh, kind of uh, story that then some company will will get kind of very upset with this. For instance, Deutsche Post, they said, okay, please give me some electro electric car, right, for our operations. And those companies say, we don't have any. We don't have any electric car. So what says the Deutsche Post? They say, we will build ourselves one. So they bought a small startup that they built uh, the, 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 the prototypes. And now because they need 70,000 cars. So to become sustainable, it means radicality. It means really uh, kind of like bold steps. For instance, say, okay, right, uh, we have a big, we have maybe lots of people, right? We, we, we have lots of money to distribute, and we'll distribute it in a different way, right? In a more sustainable way. But it's it's, it's very complex, a complex, a complicated issue. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, it takes uh, I would be very grateful if you could uh, be uh, kind of outspoken and you would pressure those uh, companies somehow as, as customers, as, as the big uh, organizations, uh, to give us solution, solutions for, for uh, cleaner travel. Mm. Marie, would you like to comment on it? Just a comment also to link back to some of the experience here, particularly of some uh, on the move member. But what you mentioned, what I think is interesting, and we see uh, um, an increase of such type of uh, opportunities, at least in the arts and cultural sector, it's also like the need for more partnership between the artistic and cultural sector and other sector, be it industrial uh, sector, for instance, or to work more with scientists, engineer and I think here we have quite um, a, a number of uh, representatives from uh, artist residency uh, program here like Transartis or SRTs. I mean I'm just naming you or Cité Internationale des Arts as well. We see more and more of this residency uh, program related also eventually to this question of climate change and environmental sustainability and usually what they are looking at it's not only to call for artist contribution and, you know, artistic project, but also it's for these artists to work with other sectors. So I don't know whether uh, some of our colleagues want to comment on that, because I think this is also the interest of our panel, is that we come from different sectors, but we deal, I mean, we, we are facing the same, uh, the same challenge. So sorry to put you directly uh, uh, there if you want to, uh, because we really see, at least at the level of on the move, like this increase of opportunities, at least at, at the level of residency program. Yes, I think that uh, there is definitely increased uh, collaboration. So uh, our network uh, represents over 700 artist residency centres internationally. Um, uh, and we are seeing a uh, year-on-year increase uh, in both interest in how residencies uh, are working with artists, um, duration of residencies, how that impacts, all, but also very much about how the residency is environmentally impacting on the local environment. Uh, and so more and more what we see are these cross collaborations. Um, so for example, um, there was a great project uh, run uh, through Visiting Arts, which was a huge international project that teamed up um, an artist, uh, swapped an artist from one country to another country, except there were multiple countries involved, uh, but they were teamed up with uh, an uh, ecologist in the new place where they went to, and the, the parameters of uh, the residency was one square mile, and the project was called One Square Mile. Um, and so the visiting artist worked for the entire duration of the residency with an ecologist or an environmentalist uh, to work through a project that involved this predetermined one square mile of land, which sometimes was urban, sometimes was rural, sometimes was very politically charged, sometimes not at all. And the resulting, there's a fantastic publication about that, uh, which is easily accessible online through visiting arts. Um, and there was a lot of feedback at the end of that, which was a, a three-year program. Uh, 
and the things that came out of that were really quite extraordinary, both in terms of uh, the types of works that were developed, but also actually that idea of lateral thinking and, and looking at things from different perspectives, um, the ways that um, other sectors were looking at the work that they were doing. Uh, we see it also time and time again, especially with a lot of crossover with science, which is now a lot of science cross art science crossovers are fo focusing increasingly on environmental um, issues, uh, and y you just have you know, these fantastic outcomes. Uh, particularly active, uh, must be said, in uh, Nordic countries, um, and there's a real uh, push, for especially around the Arctic, as, as we see time and time again over the last few years. Um, there's a lot of uh, concerted effort and collaboration happening uh, there, particularly at the moment. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi. Um, I had a question relating to the idea of um, also putting pressure on uh, particular industries to change their course. and maybe it's sort of the annoying but almost necessary question in this discussion that I think a lot of people are quite skeptical about what a cultural sector can actually make for a kind of change. We do not have the, neither the demographic numbers nor the economic power to really change the course of an aviation industry, I think, or I think a lot of people would think this as well. And it sort of comes down, I think, to the, to the question how we should respond to this idea of this allegation even that the efforts that we make to to make this cultural mobility more sustainable is just a drop in the ocean uh, compared to other forms of mobility or uh, other sectors in which the traveling uh, frequency is just increasing every single day and what should our response be um because I will go, so I just will answer, uh, try to answer this. I think it's not that drop in the ocean. It's a, it's a very important activity of each organization that you have your guidelines for sustainable procurement, for instance, or for sustainable mobility. That you do your homework, as Greta Thunberg says, right? Like, it's, 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 it's funny that 16 years old uh, activists kind of like now shape the, uh, the, the, opinion but okay everyone can every organization can do sustainability management right everyone every manager can think about it and they can implement the policies they can have working groups they can change how they procure stuff and uh, they, they can kind of uh, try to change what energy they use for the institutions Right, and you can also lobby in your local council to change right uh, certain things which will be better. Uh, it will take time, but I think now there is lots of um, kind of like momentum in, in the society that it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's more possible. It's not. A, 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 it's not impossible. It's the, the, the change is possible, but it has to be uh, kind of brought uh, in by, by actors who will act and who, who will have this normativity. They say, okay, I want to change my organization. It can be changed through the top down. It, can, it should be also from the bottom up. It should be kind of participative. It, it should be co-created in the organization. But I think that the, if, if every organization can think about sustainability management and vision how to make their operations, all operations, not only maybe the energy and, and mobility, but also procurement. Uh, uh, so it would help, I think. Thank you very much. Fatima. So I think, well, thank you for, for staying with us and... Um. <coughs> Yeah, I think um, small, small actions, individual actions are maybe small drops in the ocean. Uh, but if a lot of people do little things, then it becomes many drops. Anyway, the point is... Um, um, no, no, just put it closer. Oh. Sorry, to your mouth. So the point is, uh, 
collective action um, will yield probably better results if many different little actors do kind of similar things. And um, like in, in ASF, we're, we're very, very late. I think we're, we're now working on like sustainable guidelines internally for, for the organization and sustainable guidelines because we have many partners in 50 different countries. And of course, each project will um, adapt to it. But uh, uh, it's a it's a start, and um, yeah, I think all I agree with you. Everyone doing their own um, little thing will will collectively become uh, action. And in, in, I keep saying this, Ljubljana, but so uh, because it's the same um, um, conversation I guess in, in, in mobility. There were we had a section there of some recommendations, and then there were like very nice ideas, like frequent like frequent flyer points instead of um, you know buying uh, luxury goods then. Maybe it goes to I don't know planting a tree, I don't, something like this. You know, it's it's the same model of of incentive and, and reward, but it's a different like reward. But so it's not like super radical. It's small, but it's it's a it's a it's a drop. Yeah. <laughs> but put every dollar, every dollar, every euro which you spend into this kind of multi criteria <laughs> in your organizations, multi criteria decision making. Right? Is what we spend. The money which we spend is it spent somehow sustainably, right? Uh, not only on mobility, but but uh, on other things. I think it's it, it's worth considering, right? Because you have this power over your budgets, right? As individuals, but maybe more importantly, over over the organization's budget. Uh, Lucia, I think you were the first. But uh, is it related to this topic, or maybe there are some quick reactions? It is related, I think. I just want to uh, uh, agree that I think that the, every organization is responsible for the sustainable it itself. And I just want to um, change a point of view because I think that um, if we speak about, about the sustainable mobility, and I do believe that all we here agree that the mobility in the culture sector is really important and necessary, but we have to also then ask like, why people working uh, in a creative field uh, are moving so much? Why artists want to apply for these uh, great founds? And uh, I have to say truly that very often it is just because of the financial resources. Because uh, if you work in the local, uh, local field, then you can't get enough financial resources for your project in the local field. So the very often the reason why the project is international, it's not because the theme of the project should be international, but just because there you can find more financial resources. So I think that uh, it's important to speak also about this fact that now in the a, in a culture sector, there is a lot of international projects which doesn't have to be international and I think uh, it's important to say also that uh, if there are uh, funds which are supporting the mobility, then have to be also a funds which are uh, focused on the local uh, development in the culture sector. Mm. Thank you for this. Yes. Um, uh, I would I would like to to make a, a specific point about performing arts and following up uh, on this co conversation and uh, trying to just ask ourselves what we can do. Uh, I will speak from my organization's perspective because we are uh, the French Office for Circulation of Performing Arts. Uh, and as it was said, like the living experience, uh, the, the person who was talking about the opera, but I think the opera is something very specific in the performing arts. And uh, of course there are lots of communication technologies and even that has changed a lot the way we work but it will never replace the meeting of the uh, this artistic experience with the audience so I think this thing is very specific to at least the performing arts but we can uh, just uh, ask ourselves if this uh, awareness of these uh, issues of uh, uh, sustainable uh, development, I would say, uh, are uh, high enough in our sector. And uh, I, I'm talking about uh, sustainable development because it may be old-fashioned, but 
there, there, are, there is in this uh, concept uh, uh, economic, social and ecological uh, dimension. So it will answer as well uh, to, to what you say. Uh, we are an economic sector, so we need uh, revenues, and the artists need uh, revenues, and the producers need revenues to, to make a living, and that's their, that's their job. So that should not be forgotten. But uh, we can follow as, as well your, your experience, or learn from your experience of uh, partnership, uh, because uh, ourselves alone, we cannot maybe don't do, well, we can do uh, some local things in our uh, organizations, but we can be uh, uh, stronger and have a, a wider perspective if we uh, develop a partnership maybe uh, among artists, uh, companies, and uh, producers, and venues to, to address tho those issues. Uh, like you said, to op optimize, for instance, the, the presence of the artist and the company, uh, better optimize this than uh, the, the actual tour uh, that we are doing. Uh, but that will uh, that will uh, there will be a change of paradigm actually. So we have to to just to to be to be aware of that and and follow some uh, some method that you you already uh, explained in like urban or local uh, development because this uh, can be can be done in a local or national level as well. Uh, um, the displaced, but the mobility uh, of the artist or the producers is not very, maybe, consistent uh, in this uh, uh, level as well. Sorry, maybe you didn't hear me at all. Yes, uh, it's a, <laughs> a bit, but it's better to keep it closer to your mouth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Matthew. Um, the irony of me making this comment when I've traveled 7,000 miles to be here, I, I, that is not lost on me. Um, but I think that there's, um, I think that there's a, in response, Marianne, to your comment about the, the authenticity of the, the personal experience, I feel like there's an extent to which that may be generational um, and there may be a transition. When I look at my son in a room full of teenagers and they're all texting each other rather than talking to each other, suggests that there may be other kinds of authentic experiences. And also when I go to a concert and there's an artist from the UK and they're performing with backing tracks rather than with a band, whether it's my son in a room with this texting or watching a band on stage, in both cases my reaction is derision. I look at them and think, oh, why don't you have a band? You should have a band. You should have brought a band with you from the UK. You shouldn't be playing with backing tracks. But I think that there's a topic in the arts, this goes to your question, or your comment, um, that we fetishize the authentic in a way that is maybe something we have to get over. We fetishize the idea of having that relationship experience or talking in person, meeting like this, or seeing an artist. When you think about the, the, the carbon footprint of bringing an orchestra on tour, it's staggering when you think about that. And, but of course, we wouldn't accept you know, the solo violinist playing with the backing tracks of the orchestra. That'd be ridiculous. But maybe that's something that we have to address in our programming in the way that, as arts organizations, we think about. Uh, this kind of goes to the comment that was just made um, about you know, every dollar you spend, every euro you spend, is this part of a broader perspective about how do we minimize this? Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Yes? Just as a follow-up from what Matthew said, I just wanted to share with you a little lovely story. Um, there was a, two artist groups, three individuals in each group, one in Iceland and one in Australia, that were commissioned to make virtual work together to happen within the Adelaide Festival. And this group of artists, they decided immediately uh, that they would not make a virtual work. They decided to use actual letters to each other and using the postal services of developing the work over one year. And then when it came to the actual execution of the uh, piece, uh, the groups 
one of them was in Australia and one of them kept being in Iceland. They were never met, they never talked, they just wrote to each other through letters. And when the uh, performance was made, it was done via a fax machine on site. I saw a video of it, and I heard from my friends that saw it in Adelaide. It was one of the most profound artistic experience that, that those audience members had experienced in a long time. So I so agree with the speaker earlier that has left, and so it, it is about changing behaviors, and there are alternative ways of doing things. However, I also agree we will never replace the life experience, but all this is about changing behaviors and finding alternative ways to do the things that we have got accustomed to in our luxurious lives. And maybe also slow down a bit because I can expect that the postal service is much slower, of course, than emails. So maybe we're... <laughs> so maybe we're also talking about slow art, referring to what Lucia said, that to have it local and slower and also consuming and producing less, maybe in a cultural sector. Um, uh, sorry, questions or comments? Okay. Uh, maybe I'll draw on a few people's comments, uh, uh, talking uh, sustainability. Uh, sometimes uh, when we uh, implement uh, some projects, either European or, or national ones, we call it, let's keep it uh, forever, let's make it sustainable. But uh, maybe we, we miss the, the, the meaning uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, we, we think that when it's financially sustainable, when we get funds, then okay, we call it sustainable. Uh, I work in sustainable urban development and I'm sometimes thinking, is it really is urban development uh, sustainable? What does it stand for? Uh, so, <laughs> just to <laughs> you can th think further. Um, and then mm, these two approaches. Uh, um, as individuals, we can do a lot, although it can be a drop in in the ocean. On the other hand, there is a uh, chance to make partnerships or to to use activism approach, to use political parties, to lobby against something for something. Uh, you see the change in the automobile uh, industry. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the, the aircraft companies will um, sooner or later follow. Uh, there is some speaking about uh, e electronic or e uh, electric uh, planes, but they have their own troubles, you know, Boeing, uh, Max 7, 8, 7 or those. So uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, taxation. Taxation is a, is a very strong tool. I don't understand why uh, this kerosene is not ta taxed yet or there's no consensus. So um, there is different levels, tiers of uh, possible action uh, and it depends uh, on everyone and how people can make uh, lobby, how can make partnerships to go for their um, for sustainable goals, say. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, Edita. Yes, uh, I wanted to refer to this uh, aspect of sustainability, but coming back to the uh, to the uh, to the mobility of ideas and the aspect of data, uh, storing data and sharing data. Because as Marianne mentioned, uh, uh, the internet technology is polluting too. And I have a question to you if you discuss it in your institutions, because there are many networks. So you store a lot of data, you share it. And um, yeah, like, um, is it an issue already that you discuss uh, within the institution? Do you use some maybe open source programs? Did anyone of you had a chance to work on some, I don't know, blockchain um, projects? Um, this is a question. Thank you. Hello, institutions. Uh, 
Uh, I think as far as Arts and Theatre Institute is concerned, we haven't discussed this, have we? No, we haven't, we haven't discussed this, but this made me think about another issue, which is uh, sustainability versus authenticity, or sustainability versus originality, and how do we deal with these issues? For example, we, we talked a lot about having the personal experience or experiencing a theater performance or a music, uh, music performance. And uh, I think this, this discussion will take a bit longer until we come to some kind of a feasible co conclusion because, of course, the human element is, uh, at this point of time, maybe the newer generation will be satisfied with only seeing a performance on the screen, maybe because they haven't seen enough live performances to see the difference. So the question to us is yet again, should we support it or should we try to find another way in how we can approach this topic? But maybe to come back a bit to the, uh, to the uh, drop in the ocean topic, and uh, I was thinking uh, in terms of the residency field, there are very good examples in Asia and especially in Taiwan in how they are working with sustainable issues. And uh, I was thinking about um, a residency in uh, uh, Chenglong wetlands, which is an area that is directly affected by climate change where the wetlands are getting dry, so all the flora and fauna are, uh, are kind of disappearing. So what they are doing is that they are inviting artists to, to apply to make, an, uh, to make a public artwork and use only the natural materials from that area. So they are not allowed, or if they would like to use a material that they need to buy, they need to use money from their artistic fee. So in that sense, I think there is a lot of small organizations doing things in their areas. And then we're, while using them as examples of best practices, we can definitely learn something and eventually hope that some other organization in some other part of the world will uh, take this as a good example and do something else in their area. Thank you. It's another voice for a local artist. Yes, please. Maybe I have some uh, comments. Uh, I think uh, about the drops in the ocean. I think uh, your very important role is to y you are you could promote the sustainable mobility. Uh, I think culture is uh, so close to the common people, and if culture promotes sustainable mobility, uh, it could work. So that's uh, I think big drop in uh, in the ocean. And second thing, uh, we speak about the technologies and uh, uh, planes. Uh, it's true that uh, technology is not uh, everything, and uh, if you change your one trip to uh, one Skype, it's great. Per month, per year, it's great. But uh, still, it will be necessary to use planes, definitely, because if you want to travel um, from Europe to Asia or to, to the US, it's uh, impossible to, to travel by, by ship. So, uh, for example, if you need to use, or uh, your, your artists uh, need to use a plane, there is a possibility to use, uh, for example, uh, newer uh, aircrafts with uh, new, uh, new um, engines. So, uh, you can choose, uh, for example, some aircraft uh, with uh, Boeing 787, uh, which is made from composites and, and, and so on, and not, for example, a jumbo jet, uh, which has four motors, four, four engines, and uh, consume uh, more, more uh, f fuel. So uh, you, you, can, uh, you can find a way uh, also in the, in the uh, airplane traveling. It's difficult and neat. Uh, some advices, uh, for example, from scientists or something like that. It's about this cooperation with them. But there is a possibility uh, to to ch to choose a way uh, more sustainable, not the real sustainable way, uh, in the airplane tra uh, traveling, or uh, definitely use uh, some uh, some uh, more uh, often uh, connection than some small uh, airplane between the cities, as, as uh, we s spoke about it. So I think that's... 
that's all. Well, we talked about uh, talk about airplanes mostly, but uh, do we know uh, if, if we eliminated excessive flying, if we eliminated airplanes, what are the percentage of uh, of uh, other threats to climate uh, compared to airplanes? Maybe you with your background to environmental studies. <laughs> Is it um, only drop in the ocean? <laughs> I'm not good at numbers, but I read an article just before this present uh, this panel discussion. Uh, in total, uh, the, the 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 portion of air travel and and carbon dioxide is not that high. Uh, we, as one would expect, uh, there is other fields like industry or agriculture, uh, and they argue uh, in that article. <laughs> that it's because it's not we are not that far that the 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 third world would be flying so if we look at it from our developed countries point of view uh, maybe we are not growing uh, the emissions in air travel uh, i haven't i don't know but, but they will and um, i think it's also about some kind of uh, taxation or subsidizing, non-subsidizing, this kind of um, maybe sometimes uh, you, you use less travel or whatever uh, you call it. Uh, so we should look at it in a, in terms of uh, regional, territorial uh, way, uh, developed, less developed. Uh, I don't know how how which way uh, it, maybe there is. We would need an economist to tell us the, the numbers and what the trends are. Maybe uh, Václav showed some um, slides relating to this and can comment well, on it further. it's a hypothetical <laughs> question. It would never happen. Like We can't avoid airplanes, as you said. Never mind. It's fine. Yes? Drop in the ocean <laughs> again? No, no, I just wanted to add, I just looked it up again. Um, only 80%, 18%, 1-8, uh, of the world has ever flown. So I think that is indeed the, <laughs> the issue. Marie? That's exactly also related to uh, one of the first comments I made also, like this question has also like to be uh, taken in a more global scale because Again, it's uh, uh, the question of choosing or not cho choosing to take the plane. But as Lucy Lucia uh, said, you know, like um, many, I mean, if we remain in the art and cultural sector, many artists and cultural professionals, they have to go to another country because they don't find enough funding resources or they don't find the training opportunities or they don't find like touring opportunities for their work. So to make a living out of it, they need to go out. So it's, I think, uh, once again, it has also like to be um, seen from different contexts and in a more global scale as well. I don't say it's easy, but uh, otherwise it looks as if we can have this choice, but in many cases, people don't have also this choice. Yeah. Yeah, and from a funding organization, like, like point of view uh, in support of cultural mobility, it's kind of, I mean, we get, let, let's say, we get um, an average of about 900 applications for the travel grant and we, we support about 100, so that's about a um, 10% um, support rate but in the past, like, two, three years. But in a way, like what you said, um, only, if only 18% of the world has traveled and we are encouraging travel, there, there exists a, an imbalance that we are addressing in, in in Asia and Europe in the two regions that we are working in to, to redress um, this imbalance. So I guess in a way, uh, a travel grant, a funding organization that kind of contributes in deciding who, who is traveling now, you know, who can travel now or who cannot. So th this awareness of responsible mobility, like, you know, we um, going, going 10,000 kilometers um, to, to do a one hour performance is obviously something that we, we can't, um, we don't encourage. And it also um, is embodied in, let's say, criteria for, for selection in, um, in travel applications. It, it can come in the form of incentives for greener travel in terms of distances. But like in, in our criteria, we, we give a higher emphasis, for example, in cross-sectoral synergies. So 
um, cross-sectoral synergies, let's say art and, and the environment. We've, we've supported artists to go to the Creative um, Climate Change Leadership Program or, or residencies or trainings and workshops where, where artists and professionals from the cultural sector contribute to to local environment. So yes, there is a carbon footprint issue of traveling from Europe to Asia or Asia to Europe, but if they go somewhere where there is a high potential for a multiplier effect after, and they contribute to like the wider picture of addressing issues in climate change and give solutions to global problems, then I think um, the negative effects of, of, of traveling can be offset a bit by thinking in the long term of what they contribute in return when they come home and when they engage with their community and how they've affected the place that they went to. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any last comments? You're slowly closing up the session since... Uh, okay. So, uh, as for the minimum for cultural institutions and artists, uh, what we can do, even though we might be dropping the ocean, uh, we are... Uh, might be influencers, culture sector, uh, or culture allies. Uh, and we can send a message to other sectors, and um, uh, we can also make partnerships uh, to uh, make a pressure on our authorities and people who are actually decision makers and uh, policy makers. Uh, and to what from what I've heard here, it's also about balance because we can't and we don't want to avoid personal contact and uh, human contact in arts and culture. Uh, it sounds like a nonsense to me. We can uh, we can use technologies um, to um, and to better planning to make our trips more effective. So to me, it's more about balance. It sounds like to be about balance and supporting also slow art maybe and local artists and. Uh, work effectively with the uh, communities. Um, so, if um, there are no other comments, I would. Yes, yes, very last one. Um, is there a microphone over there? Hey, um, just like when you were um, summing it up, I, I was also thinking what might be another, uh, not like solution, but what this cultural world can do to uh, fight climate change, also to support uh, other movements who are not per se cultural, but are environmental movements. And like you were talking a lot about this like personal or individual uh, contribution about like flying, uh, about cars, etc., etc. And again, there are drops uh, in the sea because like what we actually need and what is the radical uh, challenge, what is the radical way is like to see it more like in the context as a, of economies of, of we need to attack uh, the biggest polluters etc 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 so i think like what is really important now is that these institutions like not just cultural institutions but environmental uh, organizations movements like i don't know greenpeace free uh, 350.org etc etc like merge and like cooperate and uh, help each other out and there are like people doing uh, you may, might have heard about extinction rebellion and like people doing these radical actions, and I think like what this is what can work very well as well, that the cultural institutions support movements like this because we we all know we don't really have time for our individual changes because we see that it's not going anywhere because there are only few people who actually think about it like we might think about it and are trying to lowering I don't know driving cars, flying, etc. It's important, but it's not the only solution. Or it seems it's not uh, going fast enough. So, as I said, I think this is also really important uh, to connect with other movements who might not really be cultural, per se. Okay. Okay, really... Uh, very, very short uh, contribution. Uh, you are, uh, most of you are uh, from abroad, and if you go back 30 years ago, uh, we had a something called a Velvet Revolution, where we overthrown the regime. And who was behind the movement? It was the, the the cultural movement, the actors, then environmentalists, uh, and then a lot of students. So this kind of uh, joint effort helped us to <laughs> get rid of the communism. So maybe it's a good, good example. Maybe we'll get rid of the climate change. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
<laughs> well, let's hope for that. Uh, so thanks to everybody uh, for being here. I would like to thank also the organizers of the whole OT, uh, OT meeting, Martina Hajková, Martina Pecková, Černá, Pavla Petrová, and the girls from Arts and Theatre Institute and uh, Camp Vijay for a uh, whole streaming thing with the live capturing that you can see behind me. Uh, so thanks, Camp, for technical support and uh, enjoy the rest of your time in Prague. Thank you. <laughs>